The following interview was conducted with Richard McDowell for the Purdue University Oral History Program. It uh, took place on Monday, March 3rd, 2008 at his residence in West Lafayette. Also sitting in is his wife, Mary. The interviewer is Catherine Marquis, the Oral History Librarian. Welcome. Tell us a little bit about where you were born in your early years and siblings. I was born in Muncie, Indiana in 1924. I had a brother who was one year older than I. He was born in 23, and I had a sister who was born in 27. She was three years younger. Uh, our family uh, moved a great deal in my early life because my dad was a tool and die maker. He went wherever he could get the best job. So we lived in Muncie for a while. We moved to Marion, lived in Marion for a while. I actually started school in Marion, Indiana. But then we came back to Muncie again for a while, and then back to Marion again. And finally, in my, at the end of my junior year in high school, we moved to Fort Wayne. That was in 1941. World War II was just underway, and Studebaker Aviation had built a new plant in Fort Wayne, and they hired my dad to come to work there and be the tool room foreman. In 1941, I entered Southside High School, where I graduated in 42. After I graduated in 42, I went to work for Studebaker Aviation in Fort Wayne. Might tell you right now, neither one of my parents went beyond the seventh grade in school. They both had to quit school to take care of their parents who were not well, and so they didn't really have much of a form, what I call a formal education. College was never mentioned at home among our family, my brother, sister, I. I spent two years with Studebaker Aviation as an apprentice tool designer, learned a great deal about tool design and tool making and so on. The war was winding down and I knew that I was going to have to find somewhere else to work. So I talked with my dad about it, and I said, what do you think I should do? He said, well, I think you ought to go to college. No one else in our family has ever done that. Why don't you apply to Purdue and see if you want to go to school there? So that we did. We wrote the admissions office, got an application, sent it in, and I was admitted. So in July of 1944, I had enough money that I had saved from working at Studebaker Aviation, had enough money to bring myself to Purdue, pay my way through, and get a degree. So on July the 4th, 1944, I came to Purdue. Tell us what the campus was like and where you lived and what was campus life. My first residence at Purdue was in Chauncey Co-op House. I had never heard of a co-op house before I came here, but that looked real good to me. At that time, civilian students could not live in Cary Hall. Cary Hall was filled with Army, Navy, and Marines. It was a, a military base. It was actually called USS Cary. And so I had to look for private uh, quarters. I lived in Chauncey for one semester. Can there you tell us where that was located? 215 South Chauncey, okay. so very close street. to the campus. It was okay. an easy walk. Uh, there were just a number of things I didn't really care for there, mainly some of the students that were living there. The president of Chauncey House was a great friend of mine. We both decided we would go look for a private room and move out and live together in a private room. We found a wonderful place at 420 Hayes Street. Now at that time, Hayes Street turned and went out on Northwestern right across from the uh, what is now Hovde Hall. See, there was no building in there. That was an all open space, and I could sit in my room upstairs and look right out across and see Hovde Hall. So what a wonderful, what a great spot, what a wonderful place to live. But having done that, then I needed to find a place to eat. Chauncey had m meal time, you know, but living in a private room, you go out and you find what you can. In class one day, I said to the student next to me, "Where, where do you eat?" He was the only other civilian student in that class. All the rest of them were Army and Navy and lived at Cary. He said, well, I work at Cary Hall as a waiter. 
He said, that's a pretty good place. They're feeding the Army, the Navy. We have steak every week. We have real good food. I said, do you suppose they could use another waiter? He said, well, if you want to meet me outside Cary Hall East Kitchen at 7 o'clock in the morning, I'll take you in and introduce you to the dietitian, which he did. And, and by the way, the dietitian's name was Miss Simpson. Well, today, Miss Simpson is Mrs. Richard McDowell. I met Miss Simpson, and she said, sure, I can use you. I need another waiter. So I went to work right away in Cary Hall as a waiter, and boy, did we eat well. You know, we fed it. Now, here's, here's the catch. I had to work 20 meals a week. We, we worked every meal, breakfast, lunch, and dinner all week long, and then we had Sunday evening off. We didn't have a Sunday evening dinner. I did that, carried 18 credit hour load every semester. And, and you know, people today talk about having a heavy load, but back then you really were. And, but I didn't mind it because I was getting 25 cents an hour. In 1944, that was pretty good money. Sounds good to me. 20 cents an hour, 25 cents an hour. I think I, think I finally got up to 35 cents an hour before we were married. I don't remember what it was. Well, anyway, to make a long story short, after about two years, I decided that she had been boss long enough, and I decided I would ask her if she would marry me, with, with the bright idea that if she says yes, then I'll get to be the boss. And you know, it really didn't work that way. She said yes. We were married in 1947. She's still the boss. But what a wonderful boss. She's not. She's good. I don't have to call her Miss Simpson anymore. <laughs> I can call her by her first name. This last year, we celebrated 60 years of married life. So it was, the, it was a good move right. that I made on my part. Right. You got your education. Another, another thing I'm going to mention, and it won't show up on the recording, but you'll see it. The year that they remodeled the Cary Hall East Kitchen, the director of food service called us over, wanted us to have lunch with him, which we did. And after lunch, he said, I want to go back to East Kitchen and show you what we did with it, how we remodeled it. When we walked in, he went over to a cabinet and pulled out a plaque and handed it to us. And this, it's heavy, but it's wonderful. Look what it says on the plaque. On these floor tiles in the east, in, in the fall of 1945, Mary Simpson met Dick McDowell in the east kitchen of Cary Quadrangle. And he said, these are the four tiles that I stood on the morning that I was introduced to her. My Lord. Isn't that marvelous? Wonderful. Isn't that wonderful that someone would have the oh, that's great. idea and carry it through? Oh, so terrific. we're kind of married to Carry Hall. I think so, right. And uh, <clears throat> should I tell you a little bit about what happened shortly after that? That will be fine, yes. And just, The war just, ended, as you know. A lot of girls came to Purdue because they wanted to meet the veterans who were coming veterans were coming on the GI Bill. There were not enough residence hall space at Purdue for those girls. Where did you live then when you got married? We lived in an apartment that she had. Oh. Mount Lebanon University. She thinks I married her for the apartment, but I really did. Well, that, excuse me, back then you had to put your name on a list to get into an apartment. Apartments were scarce. So. Anyway, without enough residence hall space for the women, they opened two units of carry for women. Cary Hall East and Cary Hall Southeast. I was head waiter in Southeast, where a nice group of women. I, I like being head waiter in a women's hall. Been been in a men's hall for so long. At that time, we went by the old rules. Kids today wouldn't believe what we did. For dinner, every evening, the men had to wear jackets and ties, the girls had to wear heels and hose for dinner every evening. Strange today. <laughs> now, 
I think the one thing I remember more than anything else is that one evening after dinner, the head resident, who was a proper southern lady, called me over to her table. She said, Dick, we have a problem in this dining room. And I said, what's that? She said, some of the girls are coming in without hose. I said, oh, I hadn't noticed. She said, well, I want you to start paying attention. If you see a girl come in the dining room without hose on, you send her back up to her room and tell her she has to put on a hose. Now here, I'm a student, a waiter, and she was telling me to ask the girls to go back to their room to put on a hose. I, I didn't think fast enough. I should have said, should I feel their legs first to be sure? But I, did, I didn't say that. I just hesitated a minute and I said, you know, I don't work for you. I work for the dietitian in the kitchen. I said, you go talk to her about that. Oh, she said, I can see I'm not getting anywhere with you, and she got up and walked out. But I, I think about that as being so different from the atmosphere today and the way what they call, yeah, that, what? that this young freshman, sophomore boy should tell these girls to go put on hose. Interesting. Well, anyway, things were quite different then. We were setting tables at 4 o'clock every afternoon, putting on placemats, this, and they, everyone was assigned to a table, and they had a, a head person at each table who kind of watched after things and managed things. And I remember later on when I was in the men's part, I had worked in all of, all of the dining rooms in Cary Hall at one time. When they would come down to dinner, they would have to wait until I, as head waiter, opened the door for them to go in. I would stand there and wait until they all got to their seats. They stood. They didn't sit down. They would stand. I had a four-note chime. I would ring those four notes. Someone who had been designated would say grace, and then they would sit down, and the waiters would come out with the trays. and So the in. meals were served. Again, isn't that something sure. to have, have them say grace before meals? I told President Bering that one time. He couldn't hardly believe that they did that back in those early years. I said, it was all very formal, very nice. Mm -hmm. But I did get tired of calling her Miss Simpson, so I had to change that part. But that was my early early years in the not not living in the residence halls. I was just a waiter who worked while there. you were in school. And and eventually I moved in some of the um, army barracks that they brought on campus to take care of this enrollment. You see, when I came here, there were thirty seven hundred students in Purdue in nineteen forty four. Thirty seven hundred. Now, the war ended right after that, and look what happened to the enrollment. In 45, it went up to 5,600. In 46, 11,000. In 47, 14,000. Wow. Now, during that time is when they brought in all of these army barracks to make room for students. Sure. And I lived in the Seneca dorm that was brought in from Peru, Indiana, from the were these portable Station. buildings, portable like they, they were. They were not portable, but they were you know built in such a way like a farm building. They could load them on a tractor and haul them in, bring not them in. By tra not, not national homes or anything. No, well, were they no. like the ones where Armstrong is now? Do you get Armstrong? Remember the uh, uh, Quonset huts that were there? Well, uh, they did bring in some Quonset huts, but uh, what I lived in was. Uh, a little different than that, oh. and it's too bad the this this can't pick up pictures and show you because I, <laughs> it was an interesting time on campus. And by the way, this was one of the uh, very uh, heavy problems that Hubby had to get all of these. But here's the Quonset huts. The buildings I lived in were over here in okay. this area. He's showing a, a, a book that came out and has during that year. Yes, and I'm going to talk about this book a little bit later on. Okay. But that shows the pictures sure. and backs up some of the things that, that I can tell you about Purdue right. and what happened. Okay. But we had, uh, we had a wonderful time. Right. And then we, now, now you, let's talk a little bit about uh, you, you became hired, got an appointment at Purdue after you graduated. Let, let me back okay. off just a little bit and tell okay. you that when I came to Purdue, my intention was to get a degree in engineering. Once I started that program, I decided, you know, this is not really what I'm interested in. I was more interested in teaching, 
working with students in a laboratory like that. So I dropped out of engineering, went into uh, industrial tech. And it wasn't technology then, but it was an industrial industrial uh, education. Uh, it, it was an in, in the education trade and industrial education, and took classes to become a teacher. And after I got that degree, I had an opportunity to work at Cary Hall in the uh, supporting units, grill, post office, laundry, dry cleaning units, so manage that. And after about two years at that, I said, I want to get back into teaching now, so I'll do what I want to do. So I went over to Michael Golden Labs and talked to the fellow who was in charge of all that. He said, yes, I can use someone. I'm come right away. So, so that's when I really got into teaching in a department that was called General Engineering. Now, General Engineering was the forerunner of Industrial Engineering. After I worked for about two years in General Engineering, they de decided to split off and they would they were forming the industrial engineering department at that time. They would put the machine tool lab, the foundry, and the welding in industrial engineering. And then the drawing and other areas went with other departments on campus. Okay. So that's how I wound up in industrial engineering, teaching manufacturing processes. And along the way, the head of industrial engineering came to me and he said, you know, the Department of Freshman Engineering would like to have someone from our area represent us in their department. Would you like to go part-time in freshman engineering? I said, well, it sounds interesting because, again, I would be meeting with students, talking about the various areas of engineering, trying to get some of them that come into industrial engineering. So I went over there. I think about quarter time, something like that. After a while, they kept telling me, you know, we'd like to have you on our full-time staff. I guess they thought maybe I was doing a pretty good job, so they wanted me on their full-time staff. I went back to the head of industrial engineering, and I said, you know, I have an opportunity to move to freshman engineering, and I think I'm going to take it. I think it would be a wonderful opportunity for me. I could continue teaching my one course in industrial engineering, but I'd be a full-time staff member in freshman. He said, well, there, I don't really think there's as much future for you there as there is here in industrial engineering. I said, well, I'm not so sure about that. Well, after I made the move, I found out why he was encouraging me not to move. He had sent through a promotion for me from assistant professor to associate professor, and he, he, he knew that was going to go through, and he hated to see me leave. Well, the first, first six months I was in freshman engineering, I was promoted to associate professor, and then that made sense. But then later on, the interesting thing about it is he left industrial engineering, became the head of freshman engineering, who was that? Amrine, Harold oh, Amrine. Okay. So I worked. I was working again for Harold Amrine. Okay. And uh, tell us I, a little bit about going on, now. You're in freshman. Go yeah. on and talk a little bit. And about I that. think it was during. I believe it was during his stay in freshman engineering that then I was promoted to full professor. That's an interesting story because my career at Purdue is so much different from most of the engineering staff members at Purdue. I didn't have a doctor's degree, I didn't do any research, I didn't publish anything, and I got promoted to full professor. Now how could that happen? And I'll tell you why I think it happened. I was very active in the teaching area. I had all kinds of classes I handled all of the day on campus with Jim Birney, as you know. I handled all of the uh, freshman engineering lectures, again with Jim. You know, Jim and I were real buddies all the way through. But then I was so active in committee work. I don't know that it's necessary that I read all the committees, but I've got them listed because I think this is really what made a difference in my promotion at Purdue and Work. And the ones in red, I was chairman of all of those committees. In my promotion to full professor came from my teaching and my outside, well, what do we want to call it? Extracurricular uh, activities. Well, it wasn't extracurricular activities. The outreach? 
it was uh, all of my committee work, right. which you, uh, which service, you service to service. the university, right. teaching and service. By working with all of these committees, and when you read this list, you'll see that I was appointed by the president to some of these. I was appointed by vice presidents. I was appointed by department heads. People who knew me thought I would serve well on the committee. And I worked all of these years in these 33 different committees and actually chaired president. I, I had a phone call one afternoon from John Hicks. John was assistant to the president at that time. He said, Dick, in about a half hour, you're going to get a call from President Hovde. And he said, I want to tell you what it's all about, so you'll be ready to give him an answer without taking up too much of his time. I said, well, what's that, John? He said, well, he wants you to be chairman of the uh, Committee on uh, Appeals Systems, students who were being dropped from the university who were appealing the, the, the drop, and they had to come before this committee to see if they could get back in. So I said, well, sure, I'll be glad to serve as chairman of that committee for worked so well and that all happened about the time the students were having so many uprisings on campus and causing President Hovde a lot of grief. Well during that about a three-year period when I chaired that committee I met every Wednesday afternoon with President Hovde. We had a nice discussion about what was going on, who was coming in to be heard, whether or not we changed the decision that the Dean of Men's Office had made and, and we didn't. Uh, they had good grounds. But it was interesting, at each one of those hearings, I had an attorney. The university hired that attorney for me so that I wouldn't get in trouble. The university dean of students' office had an attorney, and the students usually had an attorney. There's usually three attorneys at those sessions. One of the, f not the first, but one of the first hearings that I conducted was of the 223 students who had staged a sit-in in the Union Building. And of course, we upheld the statement and they were all dismissed from the university. But I'll never forget it because at that hearing, there was one girl who sat on the floor right in front of me and her nose was painted red, one cheek was orange and the other one was green and she blew soap bubbles through the whole hearing. So it was, it was quite an Interesting experience. time, yes. But I had all of these interesting experiences on this committee work, got to know all of the vice presidents, all of the deans, all the department heads. It's probably one reason why my promotion went through the way it did. <laughs> so it, it always helps to... to uh, well, service is yeah. one of the components yeah. of the land yeah. grant uh, and, and act. It, and, it, and it worked out real well. Mm -hmm. What were some of the highlights in uh, freshman engineering that, that you liked? Any particular thing that sticks in your mind? Working, I guess, with the students would be really the key thing. Let, yeah, that was. But I think probably the highlight of my career in freshman engineering was because I was close to Dean Potter. Dean Potter retired shortly after I went to freshman engineering, but he kept an office down on the ground floor, and he would come to my office often, sometimes once a week, at least once a month, and he would sit and talk. He was so pleased with the way things were going in freshman engineering, and I have to, uh, I keep notes because I can't remember all the details, but he came to my office. Quite often, we sit and talked about, here's a handwritten letter to me from Dean Potter, and this was in 1976. I'm, I'm going to read it because I think it's so meaningful. It says, Dear Professor McDowell, your contributions to the excellence of Purdue's freshman engineering are appreciated by the alumni and friends of Purdue University. As your old dean, I am most proud of you. Being close to President Hansen and to Victor Miller, you deserve. And I thought that was so nice to get that letter from Dean Potter. Right. And Mary and I oftentimes uh, took Dean Potter to banquets and dinners that we had. And I'll always remember one night we were at a dinner out here at one of the motels. Dean Potter turned to Mary and he said, You know, I'm 92 years old and I still have all my own teeth. <laughs> he, he, was, he was quite yeah, a gentleman. Yeah. <laughs> uh, now you served under several deans of engineering too. Do you want to make any comments? Yes, on I that? did. Uh, and uh, that, would, that would have been Hawkins and would have been the first after Dean, Dean Potter. Dean Hawkins 
was there when I went into the position in freshman engineering. Then the uh, the double E Dean Hancock okay. came after that, and then Dick Schwartz came after that. What about Grosch? Dick Grosch. Oh, Grosch. Yeah, Grosch was in there. Sure. Grosch was my old buddy. I used to go down and talk with him a lot. One time, Grosch walked into my office and he said, you know, I'd like to buy you all new office furniture. Wouldn't you like to have new office furniture? I said, Dick, I don't need new office furniture. I'm happy with what I have. He said, well, you let me know if you ever want new furniture. I, I, I felt like I was in the right place, working for the right people. And uh, it, it all worked out well. Mm -hmm. As you know, I had a, a good time. Now let me tell you something about President Hubbard. Okay. I mentioned that I had meetings with him once a week during that time. And he was when the we were president when you were at when you on came. campus. Right. He said one time, Sunday afternoon, I was sitting at home without much to do. He said the phone rang. And he said it was a father from out east, one of the states out east. He was trying to reach his son. Now that was at a time when there were no telephones in the student rooms. In Cary, there was a phone in each hall unit. And if the phone would ring, somebody would go answer it, and they'd get whoever was calling. This father said, I've tried many times to reach my son, and I can't get him, and I need to get a message to him. It's very necessary. If I give you the message, you suppose you could get it to him? President Hovey said, I'd be happy to. So when the father hung up, President Hovey said, I dialed the phone number at Cary rang a long time said finally someone answered and I said this is President Hovde and I have a message for so and so gave the boys name. kid said yeah and I'm Benjamin Franklin too and just hung up he said I then did what I should have done in the first place I called the university police gave them the message and told them to take it to the boy <laughs> but I thought that was so funny and he, th he thought it was interesting too that he... something that happened to President Hovde which I always think pointed up just how much the Board of Trustees liked him and approved of what he did for the university. In 1949, Purdue celebrated its 75th anniversary. You may know this story. No, no, I, but I know it was the 75th and 49. Here it is, 75th, there's a certificate. Mm -hmm. Do you know that just 20 years later, they celebrated their 100th anniversary. The centennial, yes. You know why they did that 20 years later instead of 25 years later? The Board of Trustees fought so much about President Hovde, they wanted to celebrate their 100th anniversary while he was still president. So someone on the Board of Trustees said, if you look back at the history, you'll find that Purdue was actually formed five years earlier than the first class. So we could go back to that date for our anniversary and celebrate our 100th anniversary in 1969. President Hovde would be retiring in 71. Then he could be here and take in all of the 100th anniversary mm -hmm. celebration. So I thought that was really yeah, quite... Yeah, It was thing. incorporated, but the first entering class, and that often happens with yeah. a lot of work. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, so see. they went back to that early date when Purdue was established, not the first day of classes, not sure. the first class, and that's how that all happened. Okay. And I kept this all that time because I thought it was nice to have this 100th anniversary, 1969, the 75th. And yeah, that's, that is so nice. So it makes an interesting, right. for interesting discussion. Good math problem. Yeah. One more thing I'd like to mention because I think this is really interesting. Good. Students think they have it rough today. In 1948-49, in the Purdue Handbook, I'm going to read this paragraph because students wouldn't believe this. It's titled, Your Bills. The university feels strongly that you should pay your just financial obligations. This includes not only bills owed to the university for board and room or various fees, but also any legitimate bills owing to outside persons. Mm -hmm. The Office of the Dean of Women and the Office of Student Affairs are authorized to suspend you from the university to exclude you from class meetings until such time as you 
get your financial affairs in order. The moral is, of course, to pay as you go and not to avoid any embarrassment which might, assist, might ensue if you don't. If they found out you owed money to somebody, you had to pay that or they wouldn't let you graduate. Hmm. Now that's back in 40, 48, 48, 48 yes, A couple 49. years after the war was over. So things really did change, didn't they? Right. And I, I, oftentimes I have joked and I said to Mary, you know, when I was a freshman and sophomore at Purdue, my roommate used to say, I've got money I haven't even spent yet. Well, now they have to say, I spent money I don't even have yet. <laughs> so it's just a, a complete the reversal. Coin, right. But yeah. it's interesting. It's, it's hard to believe that they had rules like that. Uh, needless to say, my bills were already paid, and I didn't have to worry about it. But some students probably had a problem with that. I would think so. That's right. What about athletics? You've been involved with athletics all the time? No. Oh. I was not an athletic type. I didn't even go to the games. I just was so busy working at Cary Hall and going to class and trying to get things done. That, uh, I was not an honors student, so I had to work hard to get everything I got. And you were working full time. I made it through and, and got my degree and got my wife and did all these things that were real important. That's what uh, a lot of the women came for. You know? I want to... What would you like to chat with about now? You have something... I wanted to mention something else here. Where is that sheet that has it? Here it is. See, I came in July of 44, retired in 1991, and I'm still here today. That's 64 years that I've been Very good. at Purdue, around Purdue, and doing all kinds of things. The FAC Fellow Program, let's talk a little bit about well, that. Oh, okay, okay, but you just got let me, there. Let me right. pick up on my teaching. I said something about the committee work, but the reason I was... Well, first of all, see, I, I have been selected. My name is on the board of good te great teachers in the union building. I had over 47,000 students while I was in school, while I was teaching. And that came about simply because I had all of the freshman engineering lectures for about 25 years. In addition to teaching classes, I would go off and teach during the week. And a lot of students knew who I was. Right. Uh, an interesting experience I had in that regard. I had freshman engineering lectures, and at the close of one of those lectures, I saw this young boy get up in the back row. This was in E 129, about 250 students in there. He was really coming down the aisle pretty fast. I knew he must have a question. I'd better wait a while. Finally, he got close enough to where he talked to me. I'll bet you knew my grandfather. He went to Purdue. <laughs> And I thought, boy, I must look old at that boy. <laughs> I thought that was so funny. Yeah. Um, what was your last question? Oh, you were a fact fellow. You've been very involved yes, in the fact fellow uh, program. President this was started Hubney, by President Hubbard. President Hubbard started this faculty fellow program at a time when he was having so much difficulty with students who really didn't understand what was going on, why they did what they did, and so on. And he felt that if he would assign certain faculty members to this group and assign them to residence halls, they could put down some of the rumors and get the right information out to the students. And it, it worked wonderfully well. We were appointed in 1969 by President Hovde to McCutcheon Hall. And we were in McCutcheon Hall until 1972. In 72, we went to Tarkington and stayed till 74. 74, we went to Earhart and stayed till 77. Carry from 77 to 82. and. Harrison Hall asked if I would come over there. I said, on one condition. And said, what's that? I want a women's floor. I'm getting tired of men. So we went to Harrison Hall on the women's sixth floor from 82 to 2003. You see, I like the women so well, we just stayed and stayed and stayed. Now let me give you one good example of what the faculty fellow program meant to students and what could be done at dinner one evening, and we had dinner every week with our floor. This girl who was sitting across the table me said, Professor McDowell, could I talk to you after dinner out in the lounge? I said, sure, you can. So after dinner, we went out in the lounge. She said, I really have a problem that I need to talk to you about. And I said, what's that? She said, well, in my computer class, my TA is coming on to me. 
I said, well, can you explain enough that I will know what needs to be done? She said, well, yes. She said, he won't hand back my test paper. He tells me that I have to come to his office to get my test paper each time. And she said, when I go to his office, all he wants to do is set up a date. He wants to have dinner with me and that sort of thing. She says, I'm not interested and I don't know what to do. She said, I need that class. I can't just quit going. Do you have any suggestions? I said, yes, you come to my office the next time you're supposed to go to that class. I said, don't go to the class, come to my office. I had the course supervisor in my office. We talked with him about it. He transferred her into another section, and then he took care of the TA that was causing the trouble. Now, you see, it, it was real easy for that girl through the faculty fellow program right. to solve her problem. Right. And I always felt like that's, you know, that's a real good reason to have faculty fellows. But we, we had a great time. We had faculty fellows over to our house for Christmas. We had faculty fellows over, I don't I mean faculty fellows, the students. students. We were the faculty fellows. We had the students over our house when the counselor got engaged or when we had the wedding. The residence the uh, hall director got married. Every time we, had a, we could have a party, we had it. And we went to weddings in Kentucky, Illinois, New York. Uh, Wisconsin, New York. Yeah, we went clear out to New York. We just had a good time as faculty fellows right. with the students. You really interact. Apart yes. and separate from the classes. Sure. Well, which, they still come just, to see us. Which just worked wonders. Right. That's wonderful. Yes. And one of the counselors at Harrison Hall came to us and she said, I'm getting married this fall. I want you two to be in my wedding. Wasn't that wonderful? Mm -hmm. We drove to Dayton, Ohio and took part in her wedding. And still today, they were here last Saturday. They come two or three times a year to visit with us. Just a wonderful connection. Nice relationship. It, right. It's just more, than, lasting. You, more right. than you could expect. Right. And, and we've enjoyed it so much. What, uh, Do you have you, something? Well, I'm going to start else? talking about some people here in a little bit. Sounds you good. Go ahead. Now? Yeah, go ahead. That's fine. Dean Potter. I told you about he came to my office every so often and said, no. It was so interesting. After the fact, it's too bad I didn't have a recorder and could record some of the things that he talked about. Because Dean, one, I remember one time specifically, Dean Potter talked to me about his visits to the White House, the Oval Office. He said, I sat in the Oval Office and talked with the presidents, Roosevelt, Truman, Eisenhower, Kennedy, Johnson, Nixon. He had visited with all of them in their office in the White House. Such a wonderful conversation he had with me. But I think the, the best thing I can tell you about Dean Potter, and I don't even remember how this came up, but he was in my office and he said, uh, you know the Miller family from Benton Harbor, Michigan? I said, yes, I do. Walter Miller, I didn't know Walter Miller. He had died by that time. But he had two sons who came to Purdue, uh, Victor Miller and Stanley Miller. And Victor Miller was the president of Voice of Music. His dad had started all these companies in the voice. Well, anyway, when, they, the, when those boys were at Purdue, Walter Miller would come to Purdue to see his sons but he would always stop and see Dean Potter and talk with him. And Dean Potter said, one day he was in my office just before lunch. And he said to me, do you go home for lunch or do you go out to eat? Dean Potter said, well, I do both. He said, I don't really have any particular uh, schedule. He said, I'd like to take you to lunch today. Okay, he said, I'll call Mrs. Potter and tell her I won't be home for lunch. They went out to lunch. He said, when we walked out of the uh, building, here at the curb was a beautiful, brand new, shiny black Cadillac. Just a beautiful car. And he said, I simply commented, uh, what a nice looking automobile. And Walter Miller said to him, yes, it's, it's brand new. He said, I just got it and I, I really like it. So they got in and they drove wherever they went to lunch and said, during lunch, Walter Miller said to him, now when you go home this evening, in a roundabout way, see if you can find out what your wife's favorite color is and let me know. He said, I'll have a Cadillac just like this in her favorite color delivered to your house. Dean Potter said, okay, I'll, I'll think about that. He said, when we got back to the office, I said to Walter Miller, you know, I really appreciate your offer. But he said, I just know 
There's no way my wife would enjoy riding around in West Lafayette and Purdue University driving a Cadillac in her favorite color. But he said, I don't want to turn you down. He said, if you would be willing to write out a check in the amount that that Cadillac would cost, he said, I will use it to start a scholarship in engineering. And he said, Walter Miller took out his checkbook, wrote out the check, handed it to him, and he said that started the very first scholarship in engineering. Very nice. nice. Now, if anybody knew Dean Potter, you knew that that was Dean Potter. He always said, people first, things second. And he started that very first engineering scholarship. And I always thought that was such a wonderful story. Yeah. And here's a man who has... This offered to him, he decides to use it for someone else. Right. Very great, nice. great story. Another story about R.B. Stewart. R.B. Stewart was a real businessman. Actually, he was the father of our residence hall system at Purdue. Had no residence halls at Purdue when he came here. And that was in 1925. He was here in 25 to 61. He developed the residence hall system, set up a wonderful business office for Purdue, and, and did a lot of things built the home out at Westwood, which is now the president's home. It was much smaller then, but just as grand, a very nice place. Mary and I visited with he and his wife several times out there. He was telling me <coughs> that when he came, when he came for uh, the interview, I'll get in a minute. He's, he interviewed with uh, President, uh, what's his name, Elliot? And he said, I hadn't been in Elliot's office very long when he said to me, is your wife with you? He said, yes. So where is she? She's out in the car. He said, well, go get her. He said, I've never hired a man yet without finding out what his wife looked like. I love that story. These are interesting old it's stories. Like, I think it's wonderful. Right, right. came straight out of Stuart's mouth, so I know it was a true story. Yeah. Dorothy Stratton. Did you ever hear of Dorothy Stratton? Dorothy Stratton died at 107 years old in 2006. She was the first full-time dean of women at Purdue. Mary and I got to know her quite well during her latter years. We visited with her a bit. She drove in from California all by herself to interview for the office of dean. What did? Well, Mary, that would have been uh, 35, I thought. 1935 or 36. 35 or 36. Around the time Amelia and Lillian Gilbreth came on campus. Her first interview was with President Elliott also. Hmm. And at the conclusion of that interview, he said to her, now there's one other person that you're going to have to talk with before we can make a decision, and that's David Ross. He's the president of the Board of Trustees. And he explained where David Ross lived out on South River Road and how to get there. He said, now tomorrow morning, that was Friday afternoon. He said, tomorrow morning on Saturday morning, you're to be at his house at 9 o'clock. So she drove out, found the place, had a real nice discussion with David Ross. When they finished, he said to her, have you ever pitched horseshoes? She said, no, I haven't. He said, would you like to try? She said, oh, sure, it'd be kind of fun. So they went out to the side of the house where the horseshoe pits were. And she said, I think I was lucky. One of my horseshoes leaned against the stake. But she said, we said farewell, and I came back to town. And Monday morning, when I walked into President Elliott's office, he said, well, you've got the job. She said, oh, good, I was hoping I would get it. He said, well, I had a call yesterday from... Uh, Who's the guy? David Ross. Oh, no, hey, yeah, I had a call yeah. from David Ross. He said, I think we better hire that young lady. She pitches a pretty good game of horseshoes. I said, just the way we hire people today, isn't it? But I thought that was such an interesting yeah. story that she told. Uh -huh. Now I'm going to go to Helen Schleeman because Helen Schleeman was a real close friend of ours and we had a good time with her many times. She was really pushing to get women into engineering. And when I first started in freshman engineering, we would get about 25 women a year who would enter engineering, and only about 10 would continue at the end of the freshman year. The program was so rigorous and not really designed to excite women. 
machine tool lab, foundry lab, welding lab, all of these things were unnecessary. Women couldn't handle them. They didn't like them. We finally got rid of them, and they don't have to take them anymore. And we began to push to get more women in engineering. And of course, that just made Helen Schliemann so happy. She would come and see me every once in a while. Uh, I hired a woman from California who had an excellent background in guidance and counseling. She had read our ad in the paper and, and called me and wondered if she could come for an interview. I said, sure. She had a degree in uh, guidance and counseling, but I didn't care. I wanted somebody who would take hold of that women's program and make it go, and she did. She found out all of the problems. One of the first things she came to me about, she said, you know, the girls are telling me there are no women's restrooms in the engineering buildings. Well, that's a downer right there. It turned out that the girls would have to go to the main office and ask to use the restroom back in the corner that the office helped use. But they weren't about to tell me, but they told her, see. So we got that taken care of. Well, anyway, she did so many fine things. It really got that program going. She was, in, she was director of the women's program in engineering for about two and a half years. During that time, we this went the from... This is California now. We went from uh, about 100 women in engineering to 1,200 women in engineering, and it just kept growing. But she did a fine job. Now, she didn't have an engineering degree, so there was no way I could get her a promotion. I couldn't get her an academic rank, even though she deserved it. In 1971, President Nixon came to Indianapolis for a meeting and he had he presented an award to President Hovde. So the immediate staff under Hovde went to that dinner meeting where that award was presented. Don Mallett, I don't know if you ever know him or not. Don Mallett was the vice president in charge of academics. Very, very good man, great man. He had a heart attack at that meeting in Indianapolis. Of course, they flew him back here and so on. And he was out of the office for, oh, a month or better. When he came back to his office, President Hovde didn't want to give him a full load. So he said, I'm going to give you a special assignment. He said, I want you to go around to the different counseling offices, find out what they're doing, how they're doing it, why they're doing it, and see if we can improve some of our counseling services. I had a three-hour meeting every Wednesday afternoon with Don Mallett, the vice president for uh, academics. And when we talked about Donna Frohreich and her work with the women students in engineering, he was so impressed. He said, what is her rank? I said, she doesn't have rank. She's, an she's a, a counselor. Why doesn't she have rank? I said, she doesn't have an engineering degree. Is that the only reason? I said, well, that's what they tell me. They can't give her rank if she doesn't have an engineering degree. You send her name through the next time around, I'll see that it gets through. Send her name in. She became, as far as I know, the only person who ever received professorship in engineering without having an engineering degree. Mm -hmm. You see, it's who you know sometimes better than what you know. Exactly. And Don, Don Mallett did that, and I always felt like he did a wonderful thing for our department and for her. That was Don Mallett. Bill Fishhang. Don't worry the new Bill or not. He was he followed Don Mallett as vice president for student services. He called me one day on the phone and he said, Dick, I want to pick your brain. I said, go right ahead, there's not much there. He said, some of us are talking about the possibility of combining the office of dean of men with the office of dean of women and just have an office of dean of students. You have any thoughts about that? I said, well, right off, it sounds pretty good to me. I said, I think an office called office of dean of students would be great. I said, I only have one hesitation. And he said, what's that? I said, I think if you do that, if you want it to work and work well, the first dean of students should be a woman and not a man. He said, well, why would you say that? 
I said, well, now you stop and think about all the women on campus right now who go to the dean of women when they have problems. I said, if the office for dean of students, if that dean is a man, they're going to resent that. I said, they're not going to like that. He said, well, we hadn't considered that. I said, you think about that and then let me know how you feel. He called me the next day. He said, I just want to call and let you know that we decided we were going to combine the two offices. It's going to be dean of students and Beverly Stone is going to be the first dean of students. I said, that's great. I wanted her to be the first dean of students. Well, you see what happened? Barbara Cook was next in line, then Betty Nelson. And then finally a man went into that. But it was a transition and it worked very well. Right. And right. if they had named Brian Clemens as Dean of Students, there have been a lot of women upset on this campus. I always thought it was great that Bill Fishhang had the common sense to call me and talk to me about it. Right. That probably helped a lot. Well, That's anyway, good. I want to talk about somebody else who did something for me very, very unusual. Colonel McDonald. He was the commandant for the Army ROTC here at Purdue. And I knew him through my committee service where I was on the Military Affairs Committee. And this was, uh, oh, sometime after I'd gotten to know him. I had a nephew who was in the uh, Vietnam War. His time of service was up. He was coming home. My brother called me about the middle of the week and he said, Jim's to get in Chicago on Saturday afternoon. We're going to have a big homecoming at our house on Sunday. We want you and Mary to come. We're going to have a nice welcome for him. I said, fine, we'll be there. Saturday morning, about 9 o'clock, I had a call from my brother. He said, well, the celebration is off. I said, what do you mean it's off? Jim's not going to get here till next week. I said, what's the problem? He said, well, he got into Fort Lewis, Washington, and his induction papers were missing from his packet. And they cannot confirm his place of induction because Fort Benjamin Harrison in Indianapolis is closed on Saturday. So they said he has to stay in Fort Lewis, Washington until Monday morning when they can clear it with Fort Benjamin Harrison, and then they would let him come home. I said, well, I hate to hear that. I'm sorry. We sat down just down at this table. Mary said, you know, somebody ought to be able to do something about that. I said, well, I agree with you, but I don't know if anybody can do anything about it. And as I thought about it, I thought, well, if they can, Colonel McDonald ought to know. So I called Colonel McDonald's home. His daughter answered. He was downtown. She said, I'll have him call you as soon as he comes in. About a half hour later, Colonel McDonald called me. I told him what the problem was. He said, Dick, you call his father, get all the information on him, the unit he was with, his number, so on. Get everything you can on him and call me back. He said, I'll see what I can do. I got the information. I said to my brother, now, I don't know if I can do this, but I'm trying to get Jim home yet today. I said, we'll work on it. Well, okay, if you, you can... I don't know what you're going to do, but here's the information. He gave it to me. I called Colonel McDonald and gave it to him. He said, I'll get back with you. I'll put one of my men on this right away. About an hour later, he called me and he says, we're not getting anywhere with Fort Benjamin Harrison. He said, I'm going to give them one more hour. If I don't hear from them, I'm calling the Pentagon. But a half hour later, he called me. He said, I didn't wait. He said, I just called the Pentagon. I talked to General so-and-so. He's asking for immediate release of your nephew out at Fort, uh, Fort Lewis, Washington. He said, he ought to be in Chicago yet tonight. Furthermore, they're going to change all of their rules and never hold anyone overnight when they're coming back from their service in the war. He said, it's all taken care of. I said, I really appreciate this, and I thank you very much. It wasn't but about a half hour till my brother called me. He said, boy, I don't know what you did, but he said, it worked. He said, I just had a call from Jim, and he said... He had sacked out in the barracks because he'd been up all night the night before traveling. And he said, two MPs came in and woke him up. said, we've got to get you on a plane to Chicago right away. Come with us. He said, as they went out of the door of the barracks, he heard one of them say to the other one, I don't know who he is, but I think somebody said his dad works for Purdue. 
He was in Chicago at 9 o'clock that night. We had our celebration the next day. And I always thought Colonel McDonald came through and it was a wonderful experience. I'm talking about people who help people all the way through. And this is the kind of experience I had at Purdue. Right. Everybody helped me and I helped everybody that I could. So it all worked very well. This is just a side to point, but I probably knew a number of the astronauts as they went through the classes, but didn't know him very well. But one, one day I was coming out of the Union building and a gentleman walking along the sidewalk, I presume it was his wife with him, he said, well, hello, Professor McDowell, and nice seeing you again. I said, well, it's nice of you to say that, but I'm going to have to ask who you are. Oh, I'm Jerry Ross. And then I could see the insignia. He was the astronaut, Jerry Ross. I thought that was really neat. One more I'm going to talk about, and then I'll quit and let you ask questions. Okay, go ahead. John Christian, and you probably know my relationship with John Christian. Next door neighbor. Right. John was very active in the pharmacy school in the area of radioactive isotopes. He did a lot of the early research in radioactive isotopes. He actually was the founding head of the School of Health Sciences. And that program has really progressed over the years. And, and it was just a great program. Aside from doing great work on campus, John did something else which not very many people know about, but we, we were his neighbor for 42 years, so we know a great deal about John and what he did. He and his wife, Kay, Kay was the first social director for the union building when they started. He and his wife decided early on that they wanted to have a home that was different. So they visited a lot of homes and studied a lot. Decided they wanted to have a Frank Lloyd Wright home. Now, here they are, a young married couple without much in the way of resources, deciding they want Frank Lloyd Wright to design a home for them. How do you go about it? It was a puzzle. They didn't know what to do. John said, just in frustration at the office one day, I dialed the Frank Lloyd Wright studio. And Frank Lloyd Wright himself answered the phone. John's first lucky break. Had it been a secretary or a receptionist, they would have said, well, there's no way Mr. Wright can design a home for you. He was designing the Guggenheim Museum in New York City. He was designing a home for the princes of Iraq. He was designing Johnson's Wax buildings. He was designing buildings for the Marin campus out in California. You know, just a real busy man. But John had kind of a winning way, I guess, with him. He invited John to bring his wife and come up and see him. That's Second awesome. thing John did, which was right, he took his wife when he went. There's no way Frank Lloyd Wright would visit with Kay Christian and not do whatever she wanted. He was a ladies' man. Well, anyway, they had a real nice visit with him, uh, said they would get back with him. and Well, I think it was probably three or four months later, they called, made another appointment, and went up. And at that second appointment, after they discussed what it was they'd like to do, Kay, John's wife, said, well, Mr. Wright, would you design a home for us? And he said, of course I will. How much money have you got? Kay and John said, we don't have any money. And they all laughed like it was a joke. She said, he thought it was a joke, but we knew it was true. They worked for five years. They said, we're not in any hurry. You take your time. And they went back and forth. They even stayed a couple of times with Frank Lloyd Wright and his wife in their home while they were talking about that. Five years later, they got the plan for the house. They had an agreement with him to build it as they had the funds. But they would finally complete it just as he designed it. He did a wonderful job in laying it out for them the way they wanted it and so on. They, they built the house, it took two years to build it, and uh, they intended to finish it completely just the way he designed it. But she died, as you know, she died in 1986. Well, John went on and year after year completed every detail in that house just as it was designed by Frank Lloyd Wright. But then the great thing he did, he opened it to groups that wanted to know more about 
the artistry of Frank Lloyd Wright. And by being next door neighbors, we were involved with a lot of this, helped him make a lot of his final decisions, helped him when he had groups in. It was not to be a museum. Nobody was to walk in, walk around, and walk out. They had to agree to come as a group, sit, and be lectured to for an hour or so before they go through and then answer questions. And it was a great time. Usually, Mary would talk about the youth of Frank Lloyd Wright on the farm, how he got the ideas of bringing nature into his designs. Then I would talk about the artistry of Frank Lloyd Wright and point out some things that weren't really quite obvious until I told about it. John always opened the session with how they met Frank Lloyd Wright. And I, so it turned out to be a real interesting experience, and we did that for a long time. Would you say 20 years? Something like 15 that. 15 or 20 years, we, we met every group that came and helped. And it was good for us. It was good for the group. Sure. And a lot of people that came knew who we were, so that worked out real well. But it was a wonderful experience, and we got to know more about what that house is all about, what it means, and I could point out a number of things that they would never see if they just walked in. Well, one thing, if out. they didn't know what it was going to look like, they'd have, Dick would build it, the thing that the, whatever. Austin well, this is was. John and Kay. They couldn't quite picture some of the things that were in the drawing, and I'd build a little cardboard model to show them. Show what it looked like. But we really, uh, we really. A good and, team. And now, at this time, the house is complete, just as Frank Lloyd Wright designed all of the furniture, all of the fabric, and everything, and it's probably one of the finest examples of his work since it was one of the last houses he designed, and John has gone through very meticulously and completely that just exactly as it's most of the early houses are falling apart or not being taken care of, and this is an ideal setup. We gained a lot from that. A lot of people at Purdue have gained a lot right. just by going right. and seeing and what it was all I about. I think Linda Kay, their daughter, has taken over, so she's very interested in keeping it going. Right, yeah. So it, it was a nice experience that we had living next to him, which added, I would say, to our Purdue experience. Right. I'm, I'm going to mention one more thing. This is just for fun. Okay. A Purdue graduate. Probably one of the most successful Purdue graduates I have ever known. He went through Purdue in mechanical engineering and was with the very first class that graduated in the music hall in 1941. He always wanted to work for General Motors. His first job at General Motors was a chauffeur. He was chauffeuring the wives of the vice presidents as they go to meetings. He got to know the wives and, and their husbands, so he knew the top step. But he was brilliant. He did a lot of fine things and went right up to the top in the GM. Uh, a Purdue graduate, part. too, wasn't he? Yeah, he graduated mechanical engineering from Purdue. He eventually had 35 different patents and things he invented while he was working for Purdue. But the one well, see, he invented the power steering, he invented the collapsible steering column, invented the front wheel drive. But the one that he really got a lot of money out of was the tilt steering wheel. He invented the tilt steering wheel. They shook their head and they said, well, we're going to try, but it's just a fad. It won't go. You can keep the patent on that one. Can you imagine how much money that must have brought in to him? the tilt steering wheel, sole owner of the patent for the tilt steering wheel. I got to know him when he was general manager of Guide Lamp over at Anderson, and we got to know him pretty well, and Mary and I would visit with he and his wife after they retired and went to Florida. Well, the, the story I like to tell about him, they're neither one living anymore, so I don't have to worry about them hearing that I told this story. But when he went down to Florida to build his retirement home, he wanted to put his money in a bank close by where he could deal with contractors and make payments as they were building the home. He went into this bank that was close by, went up to the window and said he'd like to open an account so that he could write checks to pay the contractor who was building their house. This house had a nine-car garage. Well, anyway, she filled out all the papers and he signed them. And she said, now it'll be a, a month before you can draw anything off of that. It takes that long to process it. Oh, no. No, he says, I don't, I don't work that way. 
She said, well, that's the company policy. There's nothing I can do about it. He said, is the manager of the bank in? Yes, president. Is the president of the bank in? Yes. Would you see if he would talk with me? Yes. So she went in and talked to the president. Came out and said, he, he'll be glad to see you right now. So he went in. After they had their discussion, the president brought him back out, took him up to the window, said to the girl, Mr. Ziegler just bought controlling interest in the bank. You let him do anything he wants to do. It's the only person I've ever known who bought his bank so he could do what he wanted to do. Handle all his deposits. That's another Purdue graduate. And he another had made Purdue up graduate. his mind. He, was from he came from a farm up around Huntington. Yeah. That's where he was born and raised. And he made up his mind he was going to go to Purdue and work for General Motors. Well, there are a lot of interesting stories I can tell about that man, but it's not right. important here. We'll have to do. I think what we ought to do a follow-up on this because you've got some other things that you could share with us. How does that sound? We could do a second follow-up interview. We, I don't. I don't have that much. Okay. I think we're, I've we're pretty well about, completed everything. Have you got any uh, uh, summer things that you want to cover? Because you've really done I've, a super job. I've trip. got. I've got uh, all of. I did mention that I had forty-seven thousand students while I. By the way, the dean wrote me a letter when I retired. He said, "You may not be aware of this, but you have lectured to over half of all of the students who ever graduated from Purdue in engineering." How oh, nice. And I, I've still got that letter in my file. I thought it was very nice of him to write and tell me that. Do you want to just make a comment about the ODK award, the outstanding yes, one? Uh -huh. Let me just let me okay. just go through this real quick and then sure. I'll talk about that one. Okay. I received the special boilermaker award from the admissions office. Mm -hmm. I received the Sagamore of the Wabash when I retired. Uh, and my name was put in the book of great teachers. The ODK Award came about because I belonged to ODK for a number of years, and each year we presented some kind of an award to uh, a counselor on campus. It was called it was called the ODK Award. Uh, the various departments, schools would submit a name of their counselor. We think this person should be the ODK counselor award. Should get the award. And that went on for quite some time. Uh, by the time I was involved several years in that and uh, always had a position where I helped pick the winner of that award, my retirement was coming along. I don't know who made the decision, but somebody on the officer staff said, why don't we change the name of the award and call it the Richard McDowell Best Counselor Award. I had won it. I had won it. I had several best counselor awards in my office. And of course I didn't object, I thought that was pretty nice. So they actually named it the Richard W. McDowell Best Counselor Award when I retired. Mm -hmm. And had me back every year when they presented that award to hand it to the person who won. Right. How about uh, any any other comments that you want to share in with us? In closing, any I, other research? There's probably a lot of them that I'll think about after you're gone, but I would simply say this. For someone who graduated from high school without having any thought of going on to college, from having come from a family that really didn't have much formal education, I could never have made a better decision than one I made when I came to Purdue. When I think back about all of the things that I would have missed if I hadn't come to Purdue, it, it just is such a wonderful feeling. I enjoyed every day I went to work at Purdue. I really didn't go to work. I went somewhere where I could enjoy myself and do something to help students. Right. And that was my goal, to help students. And I, I really, I kept my door to my office open all the time. I said, you do not have to go to the reception desk. Just walk through my door, tell me who you are. And believe it or not, I had a few students who came through that door who said, I'm not in engineering, but my friend who is told me to come and see you. And, and it, it worked very well. Yeah. You know, my philosophy of counseling is, if they can't get it when they need it, it's not worth much. And I would have students who would walk in my office and say, I can't get in to see my counselor till next Wednesday. Can you help me? And I would help them because they need it right now, not next Wednesday or not a week from next right. Wednesday. Right. We did a good job. Right. I enjoyed every bit of it. Right. 
I appreciate this. I only closed my door once. And that was because I had a young man in my office who was in tears. He was crying, and I got up and closed the door. That's the only time I ever closed my office door. This has been very nice, and the researchers will really benefit. I want to thank you, Dr. McDowell. And well, Mary. I, well, you know, this has been such a wonderful experience for me at Purdue. I'm glad to share it. Right. That's what the purpose of the program is.